Aloha and welcome to It's All About the Keiki. With me today is a really special guest, an old friend, Maya Satoru Ng. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's Thanks so wonderful to be here with well, you. Thank you for being here. And today we are going to be imagining a peaceful future. Isn't that lovely? That's lovely. And uh, as the director of the Matsunaga Institute for Peace, and as somebody mm -hmm. who has worked for peace uh, for many, many years, mm -hmm. you've got a lot to say on the topic. So let's start. Um, Sounds good. What is being done right now to help Keiki understand that a peaceful future is within their grasp? That's a, a great question. One big initiative that is being implemented here in Hawaii as well is sort of social emotional learning. And it's the recognition that, you know, the valuable uh, learning of interpersonal communication, of wellness, um, of uh, compassion and and understanding and intercultural connection, that these things are as important as reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I think that we have lots of examples here. One of them is my nonprofit Seeds of Peace, but we also have the Roots of Empathy program. We have um, the uh, Jesse Lewis Choose Love program and, and, and quite a number of others that are being supported here in Hawaii. And nationally, um, CASEL, um, which is sort of um, the center for social emotional learning, is doing some powerful things with Mind Up and um, mindfulness, but, but also um, initiatives on social justice and civil rights uh, being woven into um, uh, the traditional curriculum. I think that a big part of this is also culturally responsive and place-based learning, which here in Hawaii we have Naho Pena Ao, um, or Ha, most commonly called, which is an understanding that, you know, uh, individual healing um, should be accompanied by cultural healing and that connecting to our communities, to our culture, to our language um, gives us a chance to uh, forge resilience and to um, not only honor host culture but also take advantage of the wealth of human and other resources that we have and mm -hmm. um, I think that other um, initiatives um, that uh, that I'm personally fond of are sort of project-based education service mm -hmm. education civic engagement and leadership that you know builds bridges between a school and the world outside. This mm -hmm. idea that we need to move beyond the four walls given our technological capacities, given our, um, our um, need to address uh, global understanding and develop global competence, we can begin to empathize and feel compassion not only for the person sitting beside us, but also those who are very mm -hmm. far away. So I was thinking about how you got into peace studies. I know you're a trained educator. You got your PhD in, in higher education, secondary education, I believe. And I was thinking about the Matsunaga Peace Institute, and I was thinking as a mom mm -hmm. and as a nonprofit person sort of about peace and how do we be more peaceful. And I mm -hmm. started to feel overwhelmed because I thought there's so much to do, right? Mm. There are so many areas that we need to be looking at and focusing at with peace. So maybe you could give us a little bit of sort of peaceful living 101. Yeah. There are all these great projects and initiatives going on. What do we tell parents who want to raise peaceful children? Where do you start? How do you not feel overwhelmed by all the challenges that are coming at us? Mm -hmm. And how do you start at home? It's a very good question, right? We don't want to be awfulizers and catastrophizers. Mm -hmm. And the truth is there are a lot of stressors, a mm -hmm. lot of challenges that face our families. We have, according to the um, former Surgeon General who came here, Vivek Murthy, um, we have a ba major and, and, and very fundamental um, challenge of a uh, population that feels lonely. And in spite of our increased capacity to connect and to raise our voices and to, um, mm -hmm. Uh, to be seen on social media, it is not in fact making us uh, feel more connected as people and as children we are facing unprecedented levels of anxiety and depression and it's, um, it's really sort of epidemic. So we need not to get overwhelmed, we need to be resilient. Mm -hmm. And in 
in trying to practice resilience, I think we, we need to look at um, things that we do in our home and in our schools very early on. For me personally, I, I think that mindfulness and meditation um, you know, of a secular variety has been really critically important. Mm -hmm. We have um, opportunities to just be present with our children, have a, um, a no phone zone, have, mm -hmm. you know, strong limits on uh, social media, have practical opportunities um, to communicate with one another, to hear from one mm -hmm. another, but also to connect with nature and to be outside. We definitely also have a, a cards on our table and these cards basically have questions mm -hmm. that um, our children take turns um, asking and mm -hmm. we have ta they're called tabletop topics and we have um, conversations you can create your own cards and questions so that we're checking in with each mm -hmm. other and we're mindful also of what um, one another's needs are mm -hmm. and we're having young people think about being an integral part of the decision-making process and mm -hmm. feeling you know a, a, a important part of the family we also do um, things like simple things like if people are having um, struggles and 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 getting angry mm -hmm you know, with their sibling. Um, we can teach our children just to do, you know, breathing exercises, mm -hmm. body scans, going from top to bottom. We do something called two, 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 which is two things you can see, two things you can touch, two things you can taste or smell, coming back to our senses, mm -hmm. in other words. We can do also um, uh, uh, a wide variety of um, you know, sort of stretching activities and movement. Mm -hmm. um, we are finding that movement is really critical to mm -hmm. um, personal peace and, and mm -hmm. well-being. And mm -hmm. so having fun twister games and activities that uh, also engage the artist and the child mm -hmm. and allow them to feel comfortable expressing themselves mm -hmm. through the arts and through narrative and storytelling and plays. Those things are, I think, really important for the family. Uh, for the uh, school and and for community spaces so create a recipe for success you know a, a book you know how the PTA used to have these books that mm -hmm. were recipe books from parents mm -hmm. you have on each page not simply nutrition uh, which is critically important but also ideas for activities mm -hmm. and organizations that build you know personal peace and mm -hmm. and uh, deepen our breath so I have an agenda I'm just gonna say it and I you okay. know this because you know me but one of my big concerns with children today is um, that they seem to be targeted by sort of commerce and social media and I mm -hmm. think that a lot of what is coming at them is very overwhelming and mm -hmm. prematurely ages them and saddles them mm -hmm. with a with an awareness about the world that maybe they should not yeah. be carrying at a young age so I'm happy to hear the no phone zone because I always tell people mm -hmm. I think if you can give your kid the gift of childhood that isn't encumbered by constant mm -hmm. social media or constant technology interface you're gonna mm -hmm. have a happier healthier more peaceful child maybe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm curious about your uh, cards on the table can you give us an example of some of the questions that you might have on the card on the table that you might use to check in with your child yeah so some of them are silly and fun like what was your favorite vacation or what's your mm -hmm. favorite ride or if you were a non-human animal what would it be or you know mm -hmm. what is your favorite ice cream flavor but some of them allow for meaningful conversations mm -hmm. like one I'll just give an example um, that my daughter pulled was um, are you afraid of anything you know mm -hmm. if so what and I didn't know that my eldest daughter had any fears and she started enumerating them and it was a relatively long list I hope she doesn't mind my saying this but you know was you know she was afraid of you know not doing well on this particular test mm -hmm. or of not um, uh, getting into the middle school that she wanted and mm -hmm. but then she also said that she was afraid of me dying which you know is interesting because mm -hmm. I um, you know I, I unfortunately experience both of my parents dying at the age of 52 mm -hmm. and losing them prematurely and so maybe you know she feels these things but I didn't know that she had thought about it at all mm -hmm. so here was an opportunity for me to talk to her and help build her resilience mm -hmm. and her 
by sharing some of the tools that I had learned. And so I said, yeah, you know, I am going to die. I said, I'm definitely going to die before you. That's the plan because the alternative is unacceptable. So you're not allowed, mm -hmm. you know, to go first. That means that you're going to have to be okay and know that you have things and people to hang on to and to mm -hmm. steady yourself through that. But I said, think of all the juicy, beautiful, bountiful hours of love that we can experience between now and then. Mm -hmm. And we sat there and we really listened to the, the sounds of Manoa, the, um, you know, the, the rustling of leaves mm -hmm. and the birds outside. And we were able to focus instead on sort of gratitude. And there was a sense of um, peace that, you know, I think came over us both and mm -hmm. this sort of recognition that we don't need to worry too much about tomorrow today mm -hmm. and so these kinds of things are just an opportunity for us to know what our children are going through to mm -hmm. mind their interiors and to help them mm -hmm. because very often you know we don't want to read their journals and we don't want to we want um, to but we shouldn't <laughs> we want to but we shouldn't please don't but i think there is a sense of um you know if it becomes embedded into our family rituals, we can find ways mm -hmm. to communicate more deeply with them and make mm -hmm. them feel seen and known and understood and, you know, not um, panic about the things that are going um, not as intended because mm -hmm. that will happen, but begin to think of, um, you know, uh, the great number of resources that mm -hmm. we have to mm -hmm. sort of help one another to live better and more happily and right. you know and and I think to partner with our children in that way and mm -hmm. to really respect them and to feel um, as though we can um, you know journey with them and we don't have to because we can't um, protect them from everything right but we can let them know that um, we are there um, and we'll do our very best. Right, and that's, I think, the important thing that you just hit on is to remember our place as the adults, that we want to partner with our kids and we want to respect their intelligence and make them feel heard and productive, but we also want to be careful, as I said at the beginning, I, I'm aware that we're overwhelming our kids in some mm, cases with mm -hmm. this, I think, way precocious awareness mm -hmm. of the challenges that the world is facing. A, a friend of mine posted recently on Facebook that her daughter, who I think might be in fourth, maybe at the most fifth grade, had left a note on one of her iPads or something that her mom had seen, and it basically said, you know, how do I make the change in the world that I'm being asked to make? How do I help the homeless people? How do I ensure that I don't become homeless? How do I prepare so that I can have a job so that I can feed myself? How do I make sure that I'm not contributing to global warming? And the takeaway from this note was, holy cow, this kid is overly burdened with mm -hmm. this hyper awareness. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, a lot of people said to that mom, like, way to go, you're, you're raising a conscientious child. Mm. And my thought was, the poor kid, like yeah. she clearly is feeling overwhelmed. And, and so I'm curious as an educator and as somebody who's dedicated your life to peace and as a mom um, and as someone who has traveled the world mm -hmm. in a really lovely mm -hmm. capacity as a speaker and educator, what would you recommend to those of us who are trying to raise conscientious mm -hmm. but not overly burdened children? Yes, Where's yeah. the line and how do we draw it? I think it's, it has to be intuited, you know, mm -hmm. but I really think what you said is very important because there is that great danger of being overly mm -hmm. informed. I'm sure that's my daughter's issue as well and part of why so many young people are experiencing anxiety. And yes, to some degree, it's better that they're paying attention, you know, mm -hmm. to global affairs and politics and, you mm -hmm. know, better that they're worrying about Syria than about, you know, um, um, you know, some boy who they'll forget, you know, years down the road. But at the same time, it can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And while we want them to be thoughtful and informed um, individuals and eventually citizens uh, uh, of the world, I think it's really important um, to focus um, on the things that we can do and to mm -hmm. develop um, a sense of optimism and, um, and uh, to empower them and I, I really think whatever your age, we need to see peace as pragmatic and action-oriented. We mm -hmm. need to really 
think about the things that we can do as upstanders that um, uh, that we can implement on a day-to-day -day basis and think of everyday leadership and everyday um, you know peace building for instance if you see someone who is being faced with um, bigotry or mm -hmm. racism mm -hmm. you know reminding children but also ourselves that there's numerous ways to be an upstander in this instance yes part of what you might do is um, intervene and to protest mm -hmm. you know to um, to um, uh, take action in that way but you can also offer that person comfort you can also educate another you can also you know engage in reflection you can write a letter you know you can um, create art that is um, that is that is soothing and mm -hmm. that offers testament to you know the the beauty of um, multicultural and multifaceted uh, uh, world and perspective you know so there are so many things that we can do in mm -hmm. the face of challenges, whether national or international, mm -hmm. um, by simply focusing on the multiple ways that we can use our voice. And, mm -hmm. you know, to sort of mine our own spaces. What are some opportunities to connect with our community today? You know, we can vlog, we can blog, we can, um, we can offer solace from mm -hmm. afar or, you know, offer comfort to someone right away. And I think that to some degree, um, you know, we can avoid feeling overwhelmed by overwhelming circumstances mm -hmm. by understanding that really our responsibility is just to make, um, not to, you know, create permanent peace in the world or to solve all the world's mm -hmm. biggest problems, but to do our best to engage um, with whoever we can touch today mm -hmm. and most uh, closely. And, you know, that burden um, of, you know, you know what's happening in North Korea is not something that um, I think we should share with our children. At the mm -hmm. same time, we can talk to our children about, you know, about, um, um, you know, sort of looking at the region of, you know, Asia, looking at, you know, intercultural understanding. Mm -hmm. Can we develop, you know, old school pen pals now using mm -hmm. the positive technologies and tools of, um, uh, of the internet to reach out to someone, mm -hmm. um, you know, in in Southeast Asia or in mm -hmm. North Asia, and can we think about the things that we do, you know, that impact people, you know, afar, and the mm -hmm. choices we make as as buyers or as learners, mm -hmm. and have we um, uh, told stories from other people's perspectives? Can we change the endings of stories to try to understand what's you know, happening, um, and how someone might feel uh, a world away. You know, these kinds of things are possible. So one of the techniques that I learned in, um, in therapy training about how to help people relax and get over trauma is called um, the relaxed body state. Mm. And I think this sort of ties in because one of the ways you can affect um, a tantruming or a stressed out child is by getting your own body into a completely relaxed state. And if you're mm -hmm. holding a child who's flipping out while you're in a relaxed state, there will be a connection and the child will pick up on your relaxed state. So as I'm listening to you talk about all these options and all these things that can be done, it strikes me that one place to start would be to make sure you're, re you're raising a happy, peaceful child, mm -hmm. right? So if we have to sort of break it down to its essence, where do we yeah. start? raise a happy peaceful child how do you do that you have to start with yourself and you have to make sure that you're a happy peaceful person mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. um yeah because the kids pick up on everything that we do and feel and think and don't say and do say and mm -hmm. um i think absolutely so in seeds of peace we talk a lot about the algorithm of peace within mm -hmm. followed by peace between and then peace and service mm -hmm. so I think it always begins with peace within, you know, mm -hmm. which is developing a sense of curiosity about mm -hmm. the other, about about our ourselves, about the world, you know, allowing for, you know, reflection, mm -hmm. um, allowing for critical thinking, yes, but also personal peace, calm mm -hmm. reactions, anger, you know, mm -hmm. management, stress reduction, um, mm -hmm. thinking about uh, then peace between, which would be conflict resolution mm -hmm. or nonviolent communication. Mm -hmm. How do we, in 
uh, practice in our families, for instance, if there is sibling rivalry, getting the kids to sort of think about the needs of the other uh, sibling. Mm. Starting with needs, I think, is really critically important. We talk a lot about everyone has some universal needs, and you can brainstorm them with young people, right? What are they? Not just food, water, you know, but also security, you know, love, connection, all of these things. These are non-controversial needs. And so if we begin with um, the universal needs of the other and we start with what a person needs at this moment, then we get away from like, what is this person's position? Or, you know, you, um, you know it's not about um, who's winning then, but it's about trying to fulfill that need, mm -hmm. right? Um, and those kinds of things really help with happiness. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just um, focusing on the self, but also focusing on our relationships. Mm -hmm. And then, as I say, you know, peace and service. Mm -hmm. um, this idea is when we begin doing something with our hands, when we begin feeling like we can help others, some, you know, some, some granny, random acts of kindness is mm -hmm. popular, right? Mm -hmm. But um, doing little things like planting a garden or bringing um, donations, these kinds of things really do increase our happiness. And getting so, out into nature. Right? Getting out into nature. Going into a forest and having tree hugs or, you know, being in the ocean. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that our, first of all, our biorhythms are a little, mm -hmm. you know, out of, um, uh, out of sorts, uh, out of sync, mm -hmm. and I think that we need to sort of reconnect to remember that we are a part of all of this. Mm -hmm. One, so that we protect it, we become stewards of our environment and our space, uh, our aina. But we also have, I think, lessons I've been learning about more about sort of biomimicry. We can find mm -hmm. solutions, mm -hmm. you know, by observing what works well in nature, how mm -hmm. to find balance and equanimity and resilience, mm -hmm. and how to um, think about. Uh, what they call the, you know, sort of the the empathetic connections um, that um, exist and that sort of innate desire to connect that we have. We can practice that with all kinds of nature, mm -hmm. both flora and fauna. And so I think, you know, there's a reason why pets uh, offer therapy. Right. There's a reason why, um, why gardens are peaceful. You know, I think that we um, can return to a more natural and full sense of breathing and um, and we can develop internal peace it's really powerful with kids yeah in kids nature. respond so, so well there's so many nature. great you know programs here that are in nature you know go to the loi the fish pond the farm you know human it's still outside right but there's also whether it's kupu or whether mm -hmm. it's um, um, wild kids you know on the windward side there's so many programs that give us access and right. making use of those I think is a really good idea. And allow us to give back. So believe it or not, our time is almost over. Real, that was so fly fast. by. No. So we need your final thoughts uh, for those watching, raising peaceful KK, imagining a, a peaceful future. Seeds of Peace maybe would be something for people to check out. Yeah, seedsofpeace.org. It's C-E-E-D-S of Peace org because we work on uh, compassion, connection, conflict, resolution, all these C words. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to make sure that everyone knows that there is an open source toolkit on there that has um, well over 150 tools that you can use in your family, your home. These tools are activities, they're organizations, um, uh, share it with your teachers. There's also a wonderful toolkit for middle school um, and high school kids as well as great resources that I help to um, uh, create for, at the United States Institute of Peace. Um, um, I mean, I didn't do the, the toolkits, but they're all also free, open source to teachers and to parents. Um, take a look at the teaching tolerance materials from the Southern Poverty Law Center. There's just so many um, things that we can access. And thank you for shining a light on all of this and helping us to have peaceful children and communities. Yeah, well, we need that because they are the future and they're going to be taking care of us. So yeah. selfish motivation to make sure they do their best I and that know. we help them. And I'm so happy that you've been able to sit with us for a little while and mention these great things, including Roots of Empathy, which I just heard about recently and it blew my mind. What yeah. a simple, amazing project that is. And well, it often is simple, you know. There's the simplicity. Is it? Simplicity parenting, right? Yeah, and this idea of like the, the great simplicity that's on the other side of complexity, mm -hmm. you know. Like we push through all of these tangles and problems and mm -hmm. sometimes the solutions are really simple on right the other side. Right in front of us, mm -hmm. right, we tend to overcomplicate. 
This uh, has been It's All About the Keiki, and my amazing guest today is my dear friend, Dr. Maya Satoru Ng, who is the director at the Matsunaga Institute for Peace, Peace Institute, uh, doing many things in the community with peace and educating our young ones. So thank you very much for watching. Until next time, aloha. Something.